Over to you. Yes. Good afternoon and welcome to the panel session. The topic of our discussion today is the rise of ESG investing, what you need to know for the future. But as we know, the integration of ESG into the investment process has been gaining traction in recent years. However, as a popular manager managing a sustainability fund, the number of queries I've gotten from individuals or clients regarding the ESG aspect of my fund is so far zero. So this shows that the level of interest of retailers in ESG is still very low. And I hope that with these sessions, uh, our guests will gain more understanding about the importance of integrating ESG into the investment process. So let's start with the first questions. Uh, I believe most of us knows that ESG stands for environmental, socials and governments. But as currently there's no global standards governing the matrices on each of these pillars, may I know what do you think will become the globally accepted standards uh, and the matrices that investors will look for in the future? I would like to pass these questions to Dr. Reynolds Yu. Thank you. Oh, uh, well, thanks a lot, uh, Neil. So, the question on ESG, right, sustainability, what does it really stand for and what, what does it mean? Uh, I think this is not an easy question to you know, say because it really means different things to different companies. But what I can share is that over the years, uh, even last year, in fact, we have seen regulators such as Bursa Malaysia, they have actually launched what they call an enhanced sustainability reporting framework which actually mandates uh, companies, publicly listed companies, to report on nine or eight of the uh, core areas uh, across ESG. So these areas include things like uh, climate change, the amount of carbon emissions that companies have, uh, how are they doing with things like waste management, water, uh, and on the social side, there are issues around health and safety. Are they in compliance with human rights? And then I think most of y'all are probably familiar with the G part, right? Governance on things like anti-bribery, no corruption. What are they doing in place, right? To make sure that the company continues uh, to put, you know, their best foot forward, to continue to restore confidence, right? Among uh, investors, shareholders, that the company is on the right path. Um, there's a lot of issues uh, that need to be managed under ESNG. And one area that you have to look at is also which industry does the company actually belong to? So if you are, say, a healthcare company, then maybe at the top of your list are issues around your medical waste, right? Because you don't want to be a company that's being caught out, you know, dumping medical waste into a river and then you get caught out by the media. Then obviously that will have an impact on your branding and reputation. If you're in the construction sector, then you have to look at the amount of energy consumed that is used because that's considered to be one of the more important issues to, to look at. So, so in short, I would just say that there's a lot happening even on an international level. Uh, there's something that we call an international sustainability uh, standards board. So eventually, ESG or sustainability reporting right, will be as re rigorous and at par right, as financial reporting standards. So this is something to look out for. Thank you, Dr. Renard. How about Ms. Tracy? What do you think about the ESG matrices that investors should look for? Uh, I think just adding on to uh, what Doctor has mentioned actually, uh, in actual fact, ESG is not easy to achieve. There is a transition period that a lot of corporate will actually go through that will struggle. For example, maybe there is no global standards. So like a, a small company actually can start off with some small um, ISO thing, uh, ISO actually engagements that they can start. For example, ISO actually stands for International Standards Organization. So what we can do is every ISO can cater to ESG. So like for environment, there is actually a specific ISO to take care of environmental system management. Uh, for social as well, there is safety and uh, uh, management, like what Doctor has mentioned. As well as governance, there is an ISO to take care of anti-bribery management. So. These are the ISO steps that corporate can they themselves take to do to kick off the transition of the ESG so that we can all move forward to try to adopt the ESG together. Yeah. So thank you, Ms. Tracy. But so what we can conclude from this is ESG is a matter that's very complex. But why does retailers, retail investors have to put in so much effort into understanding the ESG aspects? What could they gain from possibly gain from it? Does it have any uh, impact on the potential return of their investments? Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah. 
Um, I think very simple. Um, ESG is not just for ethical factor. Um, it's also financially factoring. So, for example, if let's say a company has good corporate governance, okay, so with good corporate governance, for example, having competent directors on the board to make proper decisions for the management, so the management can make the correct decisions. So in the event, if let's say, directors and management make the wrong decision, a bad decision that will cause the company to have financial losses. So that will actually incur losses and it will affect retail investors ourselves, uh, our investment actually may May, have, may be affected, may be impacted. Yeah, I, I think maybe I can a add on a little bit, right? So just now I talk about how social issues, right, are coming up to the fore. So if companies, right, employ workers, you know, who are working for extremely long hours and in non-compliance, right, to certain regulations, what do you think would happen? Number one, like, employee would be demotivated, but also if the news, right, gets out to the wider public, general public, there's a possibility that some of the products that they try to export, right, might have sanctions from more international countries. So all of this, right, has an issue. It will come back to affect the profitability, right, of the company. And this is just one out of many issues, right? Imagine if you were, you know, investing in a company that, that is non-environmental compliance, constantly dumping or discharge, right, uh, waste into river pollution, which causes river pollution, and then somebody falls sick. So all of this news, right, has a reputational impact, right, on the company for, for years to come. So hence, you know, if you care about ESG as a retail investor, right, it, it actually is because it makes, right, uh, good investment sense. You don't want to be investing in a company that is at a high risk, that is so exposed, right, to all of these non-compliances, uh, regulatory problems. Yes, there are plenty of anecdotal evidence showing that ESG consideration is important to investment return. But are there any uh, academic research that supports this kind of thesis? Um, yeah, I, d definitely. I can tell you that there are tons of academic research. Uh, so, you know, that's what we call meta-analysis, meta right, by Olitsky, for example. They found that actually, uh, out of the hundreds of different academic studies that they, they, that they actually went through, right, 70% uh, of them actually showed, right, a positive correlation. So they see ESG issues, right, as almost an alpha. It's generating higher returns uh, for actually companies that truly care about all of these issues. So we are starting to see that trend happening. And actually, at the moment, even though retail investors are not really asking for ESG, right, but institutional investors are. So I can tell you that almost on a monthly basis, right, I always get requests from like big pension funds, right, asking, oh, so what is we, right, as a company at Agencyn doing to actually address all of these ESG issues? And they go down to actually very detailed uh, questions, you know, around what are the targets that we are setting, what have we put in place, uh, and are we actually on track to actually meeting it? So say, for example, we say we want to reduce our carbon emissions, right, by 10%, and if we don't, uh, then all the questions will start flooding in. Because, because our company at the end of the day is also an energy transition company, right? So we are moving away, uh, you know, from uh, fossil fuels to actually investing into things like renewables and also building the green ecosystem. Yeah, how about Tracy? As a solar EPCC company, have you seen any increase in queries from investors on this topic? Are, the, are those mostly institutional or are there any retailers who are keen to explore more about these issues? I think in general, retailers or companies, corporate individuals, all definitely have been asking about ESG. For Sunview, actually we are EPCC contractors to take care of solar PV facilities and also other renewable energy uh, service that we provide to our clients. So we are actually part of the environmental benefit uh, industry business, core business that we are having. So it's commonly asked, and in Anxious Flag, we do have a lot of corporates coming in to ask us, oh, how do they achieve ESG? So, we, well, our investment to them is that, you know, investing in solar PV facilities cannot just help them to benefit from environmental, to help the climate change, to reduce GHG. Um, on the other side, actually, they also get to save electricity costs as well. Okay. Yeah, but uh, Dr. Reynard, as a sustainability expert, what do you think are contributing to this increase in awareness about ESG in recent years? Uh, may I know your opinions on this? Yeah, there, there are a lot of factors. I think the one that I pointed out clearly is that, you know, from 
a lot of research that has been done, ESG seems to pay. You know, there's a positive correlation between good ESG practices and right, uh, financial performance, that's one. Uh, secondly, people also see management of ESG issues as a proxy of quality management. So there's a saying that you cannot you know, like manage what you don't measure, right? So when you actually start looking at companies, you know, sustainability statements, sustainability reports, if there's not much in there, you know, they just tell you that, oh, you know, like we've run two events, two CSR events, without substantial numbers backing up, you know, whether they've done impro operational improvements year on year, right? Ah, then maybe on your side, you have to start saying that, oh, perhaps this company needs to do a little bit more because it needs to be substantiated, right, with evidence, correct? So, so, so from that perspective, right, I think investors tend to think that number one is proxy for quality management, two, right, I can tell you that this ESG will really blow up. It's just a matter of uh, time. You know, for a lot of people, they say, oh, you know, at the moment, it, it seems like it's just CSR philanthropic. I can tell you that when international regulation standards starts kicking in, even we're already seeing it now uh, in Bursa, Malaysia, like just last year, as I've mentioned, they made uh, corporates, right, start reporting, right, on nine areas. They have to show three years of data sets, what targets they're doing. The world is already moving towards that, that trajectory. If companies are not catching up, they will be caught out eventually. From a regulatory perspective, they will be non-compliant. So these are things that, that are very important that, that we should be looking out for. How about Tracy? Do you share the same opinion as Dr. Rana? Oh yes, definitely. Uh, like what Dr. mentioned about Bursa reporting. For sustainability reporting, it's very important actually. It's, in fact, it's going to be a requirement for all listed companies to report. So this is actually a place that we all can take advantage of as, as investors, as retail investors. So how do we start? So let's say, which company should we study? Um, I mean, it's too much to ask for if, let's say, we go through the Busalis and then we go each of their annual report to look through their sustainability report. That is too much work. So I would say, I think, what we can begin with is, for example, um, you can look for companies that is already in the green industry, the environmental side, or, or industries that are already providing services to take care of the social part of this whole ESG. From there, you are able to minimize and, and pinpoint as to what are the companies that you want to look for. And from there, you look into their sustainability reporting and then you assess from there. So most of the drivers behind this trend is actually top-down, government-driven and regulatory-driven. But is there any other factors on the ground that's uh, driving the increasing awareness of such uh, ESG mandate? Uh, what's your view, Dr. Renner? Yeah, I think I, I think we spoke a lot about risk, right? Non-compliance, so, but it's also an opportunity. So going back to what Tracy was saying, right? If there are all of these changes from a policy level, right? You know, there's a lot of actually new accessibility to funding to actually pursue, you know, like the development of the EV space, uh, electric vehicle, to actually expand, right? On even things like RE, like, uh, renewable energy, because everyone's talking year on year about how we need to, you know, support or, or address, right, the climate change agenda. We you know temperatures are increasing. There's all these floods and droughts issues that we are experiencing, right? What can companies do about it? So there's a lot of capital, right, that's available, accessibility for companies to actually pursue. And, and that's where I think is the real opportunity. Uh, companies capitalizing on these sorts of funds, right, to really expand. Adding, adding, adding on to that, actually, all of these, all these uh, require, new requirements reporting actually is giving more advantage and more opportunities to many people. Like uh, more types of career is going to come up. The demand of sustainability is coming up, so that means it gives more opportunity, which helps the social area as well. So the increasing amount of capital being allocated specifically for those kind of uh, mandates that fulfill the ESG requirements. But for re retail investors, how and where should they start with doing so? Maybe do you think they should just start by reading the sustainability statement of the company's annual report, or is there any other methods that you encourage them to yeah I, I think i think tracy probably covered this or answered this earlier right so in in bursa malaysia right they have what they call an esg index under footsie for good so you can see how companies and rank and file right based on how well they're doing on the esg space so there's always a list of constituent companies 
uh, and they're rated like, by, you know, like four, four stars if they're very good. It means that they're in the top 25% of the uh, percentile. And then the lesser stars means that they are perhaps not doing as well. But, you know, they're still pursuing uh, ESG. So that could be one gauge of, of looking at it. But if, you're, if you want to go a bit deeper, the next layer, then perhaps it might be worthwhile to start, as I've mentioned, digging into the sustainability statements that companies need to have. Because then you will get a sense of, oh, where is the direction that this particular company is actually heading to? And some of the claims that they make, right, does it really make sense? Uh, as an investor, can you see a, a trajectory in terms of where they're heading? And then are they substantiating this by numbers or not? So, so this one will also take a while, right, for you to appreciate because more people are very familiar with uh, financial ratios. But when it comes to sustainability or ESG ratios, not so much. It's something, it's yeah. something new. It's something, something new that is emerging. Yes. So let's say for investors who prefer to do their own homework, what are the key matrices that you think they should look for? Uh, let's say uh, for Tracy, what do you think an investor looking into a solar EPCC company like yours should uh, read and so focus on in the annual report? Okay, let me share you a little bit background of like investing in, in renewable energy. Investing in renew, renewable energy is actually not cheap. Lah. So actually, they always ask, uh, oh, it's very expensive. How am I going to invest in this in order to achieve the ESG, the E part of the ESG? So I would say, for example, if let's say there is a financing issue, there are actually many, many financial institutions nowadays that fully, full-on support ESG. And how I say by support, actually, there are a lot of financial institutions are giving um, very good green uh, financing for companies to actually finance their, their renewable energy assets. So with that said, when a company invests in a, in, a, in a renewable energy asset, they would generate income as well. And of course, green financing actually means that they give you the benefit to have lower interest rates as well. And with that being said, the bottom line of the company by right should show better results as compared to a company that doesn't have this part of renewable energy asset. So in a way, not just achieving ESG, in a way, and also together, they also achieve better bottom line for investors to see whether it, it is a, a valuable investment. How about Dr. Rainer? For Yin, let's say an investor is looking into Yinsen, what do you think they should focus on? No, I think I, I would, because I'm the head of sustainability there, right? So obviously, I would say I'm, I'm very proud of what we have uh, produced in terms of report. We're very clear. We have a whole roadmap in terms of where we want the company to be, right? You know, in 2030, all the way up to 2050. These are the type of conversations that we have, right? Working very closely with, you know, our business units, uh, working very closely with, you know, our stakeholders. Uh, we even subscribe, you know, as Tracy mentioned, to some of the sustainable financing facilities that are out there because it shows how confident we are, right, uh, in the numbers that we put behind. So it's not just talk, but it's real substantiated numbers and it's also assured by a third independent party. Lah. So we do get, you know, verifiers to verify what, what we put out. Yeah. So like, let's say if uh, investors prefer to go with the FTSE for good ratings on Busan Malaysia, um, since it's a rating provided by a single provider, do you think there's any other matrices that investors could look for so that they could verify that the uh, ratings provided by FTSE is real? Yeah, Dr. Rinat, what's Yeah, so, so FTSE for good in itself, right, they have a lot of different criteria that, that they, you know, look at easily, I think, like, you know, like more than 50 plus indicators. And what you see is basically a consolidation. So they actually score companies based on how well they do on the environmental, social and governance part. What you see is basically an aggregated score uh, at the end of the day, based on how well companies are doing. Uh, if you wanted to take a deep dive, unfortunately, I think the only way and hard work is really to look at how, what companies are disclosing, not just in the sustainability statement, but also on their corporate website sometimes. And also to look out for things like announcements, uh, you know, as and when, you know, there are new, uh, you know, like contracts, uh, see, see where, you know, validate, right, cross-validate and see whether what they've said they would do, right, actually does happen. Uh, yeah, so let's say an investor wish to learn more about how to do their own homework, where do you think they could uh, try to gain more knowledge or resources to do so? 
for example, uh, let's say the CFA uh, ESG investing the certificate is one way that I have uh, gained knowledge in this field. But what's your view? Uh, let's see, Tracy. Uh, what's your view on where investors, retail investors, could gain more knowledge on how to practice ESG investing in uh, practically? Uh, practicality, actually, of course, we learn from each other. Lah. You know, somebody has to start somewhere and then if let's say, for example, I mean, Yinsen has pretty good uh, background on sustainability as well. So, we've got to learn from each other from, from uh, our reporting purposes. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so apart from benchmarking, right, seeing what other peers are doing uh, within a similar industry, uh, for us, we also have a support network group. So, for Yinsen specifically, it's, uh, you know, things like the CEO Action Network, right? So, it's a group of CEOs and publicly listed companies are very interested in driving the sustainability agenda forward. So in that sense, uh, there is this group that you know, constantly shares about what are some of the best practices, what are the trainings that are available. Um, our network, I would say, is probably a small one, but it's growing. So you know, like I say, eventually ESG, sustainability, it, it will blow up in, in, in this region. So it's definitely an area that we need to look out for and to learn from one another. I, I do agree that investors have a lot to learn, but let's say even if they learn how to read all those sustainability statements and they learn how to look at which are the, those sustainability matrices, how could we be sure that those matrices are correct? Is there any third party verifications that your firms are engaging with? I think the downside of uh, this part would be because like we mentioned, there is no global standards yet. Um, there is also no particular reporting body to go and audit what, how to measure all of these things that uh, everyone claims. So for example, in sustainability reporting, um, there is also a risk that there could be a misleading information from whatever we, we put, it, put it up um, as a listed company. All these are public, public information. So uh, it's something that should be mitigated that I'm pretty sure uh, that there's some plans to this. Now. Yeah, how about Dr. Greener? Yeah, so, so I've mentioned just some earlier for our company, we verify our ESG data. So we do get a third independent party, right, to come in to look at, you know, the processes that we have put in place, who signs off on, on these data sets, right, that we, we put out. And then also, you know, things like target validation, like is it a robust target or is it just something that we put outside, right, to show. Like. So there is a very vigorous process that we take uh, every year to make sure that we comply with that. And maybe just to mention that here that assurances also there are two types in the sustainability field. We have what we call limited assurance. So your verifiers will only come in and do 30% of sampling on your data set randomly, right? And then there's another type of assurance that we call reasonable assurance. So in the reports, they will usually articulate that for reasonable assurance, uh, you can expect that it's more rigorous, more robust your verifiers would actually look at at least, at the very minimum, 70% of your data sets. And they'll go down all the way to, you know, when you're looking at edgy consumption, right? You're metering, like, they'll test it out and see whether it's robust or not. So that's a level of rigor, that's a level of detail that is available. But as of now, from my observation, most companies in Malaysia, probably they're still just going for the limited assurance, uh, yeah, com component. But do you encounter any difficulties or challenges in implementing your ESG strategy or ESG reporting so far based on your experience, like, let's say, for Sunview? Yeah, yeah. Like I mentioned, I think uh, some information may, may not be validated just yet. So that would be one of the challenges, I would say. But for, for example, for Sunview, actually, um, our core business, like I said, we, we actually provide services to do renewable energy. So from there, actually, we educate, we try, we try to educate our clients, not just helping them to do some cost saving. We also, at the same time, educate them more on the environmental friendly, what benefits they can get out of it. Yeah. How about for your, based on your personal experience, do your firm also encounter similar type of difficulties, let's say in recruiting uh, new personnel to implement this kind of strategy and sustainability efforts? Yeah, I, I think for one, our biggest challenge is that there are a lot of emerging standards uh, because we also have different business divisions, so we need to be very well acquainted with that. So trying to keep up and understand what's in this framework 
it's, a cha it's quite challenging for us. Two, I think I was having a discussion with Tracy maybe back and, uh, you know, at, at the launch. And we say that it's very difficult to find, right, people with this sort of skill sets currently. Uh, because number one, right, it's, it's emerging, it's new, right? So if you want someone who has, you know, the, the brad and dab, right, of skill sets, it's quite difficult to, to find, find them like, in the market. But I also see that as an opportunity because with all this regulation kicking in from Bursa's side, right, everyone's very keen on, uh, you know, getting a sustainability hate count, a sustainability person. So hopefully, you know, like in the next five years, we're going to see more and more companies setting up such functions. Uh, and then our talent pool would also grow from there. So uh, apart from this kind of lack of talent pool to implement, this ESG reporting standards and also potentially low awareness of ESG investing among the retailers. Do you think there is any other challenges that are impeding the growth of ESG investing? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, impeding the growth of ESG investing. I, I think, you, you know, I mentioned earlier that I don't think it's something that is a choice, right? Sooner or later, I think this would be become mainstream. Already, I think 72% of uh, AUM already has some sort of sustainability filter, whether we, we like it or not. The only thing is how fast can we catch up, right, with, with this race and how in-depth can we go? Um, I think these are the questions, uh, like where do we source out, you know, things like capacity building, where do we go to, you know, to seek out for information. That's why forums and dialogues like this, I think is also very important because it helps us build a network, right? Uh, for us to learn and to share from, from one another. Um, yeah, but I think these are probably some of the big uh, issues that, yeah. But um, and adding on to that, I think the growth of ESG shouldn't be, uh, 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 there, uh, there shouldn't be a roadblock, put it that way. Because why? Many countries and including Malaysia ourselves actually, um, government has been very, very supportive in ESG. Like, for example, like giving us more tax incentive or uh, uh, supporting more in uh, the sustainability role, giving more examples, supporting all these investing uh, webinars. So it's pretty much actually the growth should, should be substantial. In that case, do you think our government or regulators should provide more incentive and what kind of incentive should they provide? So to promote this kind of uh, awareness among especially the retail investors. I what think... <laughs> I think, of, of course, it will be cost-benefit um, uh, from government would be the best. I mean, as much as we want to save, like tax-free maybe, you know, like, like EV cars tax-free or, um, you know, a lot of costs that we are incurring to achieve ESG should actually be recuperated in, in that manner, okay? We need to find this cycle of costs to have a certain benefit back to not just the company themselves, to the investors themselves when they invest. But since uh, you mentioned before, hiring talent in this field is actually quite challenging right now. Do you think the government should consider giving a tax rebate or incentive for the cost of hiring such talent? Uh, okay, for our industry, actually they did. They do in fact, actually, uh, if let's say as an investor of renewable energy, you get extra tax allowances for the company. And of course, on top of that, recently, um, the, our minister actually announced as well. Very importantly, uh, initially, our roadmap to, to achieve green energy is actually only 40% by 2020, 2035. But now by 2050, he has increased the percentage to 70% capacity. So this is actually a huge market that we're talking about. So for investors, for example, when it comes to this kind of news, where should we look at? If let's say the benefit comes from renewable energy, so there is a substantial growth that actually is available there, it's, it's right there for you to catch. So before, before any industry blooms big, this, uh, this is the time that we should grab the chance. Yeah, put it that way. Yeah. So there are plenty of government initiatives to boost the adoption of RE, renewable energy in Malaysia. How about, how about for Ginsen as a company that's embarking on energy transitions? Do you see any other support or initiative that you think the government should provide? No, I think likewise, right, echoing what Tracy had said, tax incentivization, uh, it's, it's, it's been there. So, you know, the targets that the government has set, right, is also very much aligned with what we intend to do in terms of our business trajectory and growth, right, in the renewable space. So definitely it's something that is very welcome. Uh, we are also in the EV space. 
So, so we are, you know, basically benefiting uh, from, from some of these perks that have uh, emerged over time. Um, and also upskilling, manpower. Um, I think our country actually needs to move on at some point in time, right? To transition from, uh, say, fossil fuel oil and gas, right? To actually the, the green economy. So in order to do that, we must make sure that infrastructure is in place. Not just uh, hard infrastructure, but the soft infrastructure, like the upskilling, uh, manpower planning. And then it's basically a whole growth, you know, and a whole ecosystem. Not just the technical engineering side, but even when you talk about financing, right? You're talking about bankers, uh, risk managers and banks. Nowadays, right, they have to start talking about how to factor in ESG credentials and embed it, right, into their assessments. So the whole ecosystem is actually all growing together. Uh. Yeah, ESG companies do get better credit rating as credit well. Ratings, yeah. Mm. yeah, so actually there's a well-established uh, notion that like let's say some aspect, let's say energy transition, that fossil fuel is being slowly phased out in favor of renewable energy. But do you think this could change in the future? Let's say, for example, the recent Ukraine war has prompted some ESG funds to rethink their stance on uh, those defense contractors. Do you think the same could happen for, let's say, oil and gas companies because of the concern for energy securities? Uh, let's say, yeah. Yeah, um, I think. There might be some pushbacks or delays, right? So, for example, a lot of people say that, yeah, you know, we have to transition as fast as possible. I think the target that they've said is by 2050, you need to have 100% renewables. But also at the same time, we need to bear in mind that we have to do this in a just and orderly manner. Lah. What I mean by that is, you know, you cannot transition, right, overnight, immediately say, oh, let's just stop you know, fossil fuels completely and just move to renewables away. It doesn't work that way, right? Because there needs to be an interim period. Like I say, infrastructure, making sure that our greed is uh, ready first and foremost. And then also ma making sure that we have the right skill sets, right? To be able to deliver on this transition. So it needs to be inclusive. And even as I, I speak right now, I think there are certain parts of the world that are still struggling. Yeah, with things like uh, trying to get just basic amenities, right, facilities, right, to uh, energy. Even that, so infrastructure is not ready yet. So it won't happen overnight, yeah. It will be over a period of time. Government do play a very big part of this role, actually. For example, um, in the EU markets, uh, in order to actually, for example, for Malaysia to export our products to EU market, actually, we are actually required to do some declaration on the decarbonization of the products or the GHG, the carbon footprints of the products that we are exporting to, to Euro, Euro markets. So for Malaysia, this is a very important factor. Why? It's because our GDP in Malaysia, actually main contribution is from the exports of our products to EU or, or to many, many other countries as well. So actually, with, because EU market actually sets such declaration, that such requirement, actually that puts us in the level that Malaysia would have to achieve that certain ESG in order to be able to achieve greater heights. But let's say if one day uh, there's a shortage of, let's say, uh, solar panels that cause uh, difficulties for your firms to implement more solar EPCC projects in the future, do you think uh, there's a need for, let's say, Sunview to diversify into other line of business? Okay, Sunview, yes. We will not just stay at just providing EPCC solar, solar services. In actual fact, we are actually venturing out into other renewable energy. For example, there are actually many other types of renewable energy that people may not know of. Maybe solar is more straightforward, uh, that's more simple technology. There is also bioenergy, like biomass, biogas, there is hydro, there is a uh, windmill and there are many many more like EV, EV themselves are also renewable energy so for Sunview we are not going to stop just at solar because we see we, we see the potential of all of these renewable energy products that can provide us uh, more more of these ESG uh, uh, achievements as well but actually not just that not just that actually solar panel will not have issue to uh, for production purposes there will not be an issue on this shortage production yeah I see. But how about for your firm, Jensen? Is there any um, initiative to diversify in other, into other areas of business apart from your FPSO and also some of the renewable initiative? I, I think we are already quite diversified. So, of course, that's the <laughs> offshore production business, right? But then, of course, we are also cognizant that we have to 
capitalize and move into the RE space. So we have solar and wind projects that are currently ongoing and expanding quite aggressively, I would say. Also the green tech side, right? We are really looking at electrifying uh, not just onshore right, mobility, but offshore or so, so land and sea. So we have, you know, like a lot of R&D projects uh, with uh, Maritime Singapore Port, right, to develop a zero goals uh, consortium project to electrify and look at uh, battery charging ut utilities uh, for uh, marine transportation. So if that works well, right, I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, potential there uh, for us to be a leader in that space or so. So for us, we're, we're trying to really capture, right, the whole ecosystem. Uh, but of course, having said so, we also have to make sure that we have the right skill sets, the right people at the right place. Uh. Yeah, but for companies like yours who are embarking on those kind of uh, energy transition projects, for investors who are looking to invest in companies such as this, what are the potential risks that they should be aware of? Like, let's say, is there any uh, hurdles or challenges that might potentially impede their investment returns in the future? Should they look to invest in firms that are doing such ESG initiative? I don't think there's risk in investing ESG, specifically in ESG. <clears throat> I think it's more of the other external factors that would affect the businesses themselves. This kind of risk is not just affecting ESG or anything, it's actually for all businesses. For example, Forex risk is a risk that any company actually will face so long there is import and export. So actually, risk to invest in ESG, no, that's not, shouldn't be an issue. Since it's, it might be some area of business that your firm is uh, not used to or does not have any track record in implementing, so do you face any challenges, let's say from a regulatory perspective, that you are trying to overcome at the current moment? I think every company, first step will always be the challenge. So everyone will have to go through that draining progress, that, that process of actually learning new things and incorporate new things and setting up new SOP. Yeah, that would be difficult actually. But how about for Yinsen, since your guys, is, your guys are also embarking on a different kind of business model from the traditional FBR, so build and lease uh, business. So is there any challenges that retail investors should be aware of? I think, yeah, to, to be very frank, I think as an energy transition company, right, they are really very diversified. La. So, I mean, the risk will always be there, like as with any other businesses, but then, when we diversify and we look at opportunities in the you know, energy space, energy transition space, I think what we're doing is actually minimizing that sort of risk. Because uh, as you know, like, uh, the fossil fuel industry is basically one that is, uh, has a lot of challenges. Like, even for financiers, right, they already have very strict ESG requirements uh, in terms of accessibility to capital. Right? Some of them have already made certain declarations saying that they won't be venturing into any new uh, upstream oil and gas. Some banks have actually made that declaration. Uh. So we are cognizant of that. Hence, you know, like the need to move and, and transition into uh, you know, other sets of businesses. But yet, of course, at the same time, there are also geopolitical uh, scenes that we are seeing. Like say, for example, the uh, Russian-Ukraine war, right? So it seems like oil and gas is po possibly still here to stay uh, for, for a, a time. Uh. But Tracy, do you have anything to add about this? No, I think what Dr. Uh, says, that's all. So let's say if a retail investor want to capitalize on this ESG investing trend, what do you think they should do to uh, benefit their investment portfolio? Should they invest more of their uh, portfolio allocations into companies like yours that are embarking on uh, solar IPCC projects? Or should they look for Yinsen like who is doing energy transitions uh, initiative as well? I think first, firstly, I think everyone will have to understand what is ESG and have more insights on that. Because, I mean, studies actually mention that the, the better the ESG, it does attract, it does colorate back to the strength of the company, the financial well-being of the company and also the growth, the higher returns of the company as well. So having understand ESG will help to capitalize your investments because knowing that, you will be able to evaluate, you will be able to know which are the companies that will actually yield better from the, from the performance of the ESG. How about yours? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I think understanding the fundamentals and where the company is heading towards and then substantiating and now backing it up right, with numbers. I think if anything, right, it should give you a little bit more confidence right, in, in the companies that you invest in. Yeah. 
Okay, so yeah, I think to sum it up, so, uh, in retail investors who are looking to conduct ESG investing, adopting this kind of practice into their uh, investment process should, if they want to save on the time and efforts, they should just look at those are FTSE ratings, so to simplify the process. While for those who are keen to learn more, they should take a look at companies in, like, let's say, renewable fuels, who are trying to uh, benefit from the rise of uh, e targets or let's say Yinsons, who is trying to pursue more energy transition projects. So I, I hope uh, all our audience will be able to come to understanding that uh, this is a kind of trend that is being increasingly uh, prevalent in the invest, investing phase. So um, last thanks uh, Dr. Renard and also uh, Tr Ms. Tracy for their participant today. Thank you, thank you. That's right. Thank you so much to our moderator, Mr. Neo Jaman. Of course, our panel, Ms. Tracy Ui, thank you so much. And Dr. Ronald, thank you so much for attending our ESG investing 